Hey, FCF Friday question and answer time. I'm here, you're here, what could be better? I'm ready for your questions. Janet, what's the first one? Our first question is, concerning the Nephilim, could that still be occurring? Are angels that live among us now able to take on human form and procreate with humans and produce offspring? Or might they be able to do so in the millennial reign? Or has God done something to make that never to be possible again? Okay. Uh, first part of the question, uh, it seems unlikely that um, you know angels are interbreeding with humans right now, but it is not impossible. Uh, particularly as we are coming very close to the return of Christ, it is, it is conceivable that that will be occurring again. Um, now, as, as far as angels taking on human form, to, uh, or can they do that today, and could they take on human form and procreate? The answer is yes. Or has God done something to stop them? Well, maybe. Let, let, let me read you a couple scriptures to show you what I'm saying. Is We don't have a definitive answer, but we do have an answer. In the book of 2 Peter, I'm going to read you chapter 2, verse 4. It says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but threw them into hell, or Tartarus is the word, and locked them up in chains in utter darkness to be kept until the judgment. So here we have a portion of Scripture where it says certain angels violated God's law in such a way that they are in chains, locked up, waiting on judgment. Let me show you one more. In the book of Jude, we have um, a very similar statement. The book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 6. They have testified to... Oh, excuse me, I'm reading the wrong verse. Um, here we go. You also know that angels who did not keep within their proper domain but abandoned their own place of residence, he has kept in eternal chains in utter darkness, locked up for the judgment of the great day. So here's twice... It speaks of a certain category of angels that are kept in chains, locked up, waiting the great final day of judgment. So, with that in mind, let me take you to one more. Uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 20. Chapter 20 is when you have the return of Christ, and right after that you read in chapter 20, verse 1, I saw an angel descending from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the abyss, and a huge chain. We've been reading about angels and chains. He sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and tied him up for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it so that he could not deceive the nations until the one thousand years were finished. After these things, he must be released for a brief period of time. So here we have three references about angels in chains. Now, the last one was for Satan only. However, if you read in Revelation 12, chapter 9, there is every reason to believe that when Satan is locked away, all of his rebellious angels will be as well. In Revelation 12, 9, it's talking about the start of the last three and a half years of human history before Jesus returns. It says, So the huge dragon, the ancient serpent, the one called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, was thrown down to the earth and his angels along with him. Now, I want you to understand that has not happened yet. Satan and his angels have not been forced down into this physical earth yet. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 24. But when Jesus returns, Satan is taken, arrested, so to speak. He's put in incarceration in chains for a thousand years. So there is every reason to believe that so will all of his um, fallen angel rebel cohorts. They will not be allowed any movement whatsoever during the millennium. Millennium means thousand years. Now, we read in Revelation 20, after the thousand years, he will be released. He being Satan, probably his, his angels with him, and they will bring temptation back to earth. And there's one final human revolt on earth before Revelation 21, the eternal state is finally resolved, and we have new heavens and new earth, wherein is righteousness, no more sickness, sorrow, pain, and death forever and ever. So I, I hope that answers that. I know there are some parts of it that we just don't know. There could be some things occurring today. Uh, I am highly, highly 
concerned about the UFO phenomenon. Some of you have heard me speak on this before. Uh, in my opinion, this is absolutely dark angel activity uh, using deception on mankind, preparing us for the last great final deception that we are warned about in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Okay. Our next question is, what resources would you point someone to who has been influenced into believing scientists who use science to prove evolution, date the earth billions of years old, and discount biblical evidences for a creator? Okay. The best thing I can do, and I'm going to... Uh, say these references, and I'm sure Joe will put a graphic on the screen, but the first thing I would do is urge you to go to this, this site. The site is AnswersInGenesis.org. That's all one word, AnswersInGenesis, all one word, dot org. The second site that I would tell you to go to is Reasons.org. So Reasons.org. Um, let me explain to you why. Okay, both of these are sites with tons of scientific scholarly material dealing with these issues, but from two different points of view. One is a Christian man, Hugh Ross, who believes in what I'm going to call Old Earth theology. I'll have to talk about this a little later in another question. The first one I gave you, Answers in Genesis, is a group of scholars and scientists that believe in a Young Earth theology. So that would be the place to go when you're trying to uh, be more aware of how to address issues with someone that's been influenced by atheistic beliefs and that kind of thing. Okay. Our next question is, how should a Christian appropriately show interest in a member of the opposite sex without committing lust? It seems like a slippery slope. It is. And uh, the best thing that I can say is... Uh, have open conversations, uh, set boundaries, good strong boundaries, perhaps uh, if you're comfortable invite other friends to be involved so that you know your, your boundaries are such that things can't happen. Uh, that would be the best way going forward without knowing you, without knowing your age, without knowing your background. I mean, it, it's, it's a tough one. It's a challenge for sure. Okay. Um, can you speak to any of your growth as it pertains to your understanding of the Bible and the way you preached it, to, uh, it 10 to 20 years ago versus now? Are there things you preached years ago that you would change after some of the growth you, have may, you may have experienced? Uh, the answer to that is yes. And uh, let me just give you one example. <laughs> My first church, um, I was a Baptist pastor for seven and a half years. Um, in those days, all we had were tapes to record messages on. And I remember a time when I was getting ready to start this church, I, I went back and listened to some of those tapes, and, and they honestly just made me sick to hear them. Now, the difference was this. Was I, was I preaching a, a biblically accurate message? Yes. But I was young. I, I was not experienced. I was a little bit on the um, harsh side. That was the most embarrassing part. And so that would be the difference. The other thing I would say is this, as life has come, uh, my theological views have not changed in any great regard. However, some understandings of what the Word of God teaches about certain subjects, as I've been able to have more time and look more deeply and research more thoroughly, have been expanded. So I, I see things, and we all see more and more and more of God's truth. We may have had the base understanding of God's truth at a very early stage. But we come to understand more about how it connects to the character of God, how it works out in life application situations, and, and expanded views of, of some, some key doctrines too. I don't want to get into it too much, but there, there's been a couple key doctrines that um, as, as I've grown and had time to research the Word of God more deeply, research Christian history, I, I have uh, slightly altered views, but, but nothing dramatic. Nothing that would not be considered completely orthodox by Bible-believing Christ followers. Okay. Um, our next question is, concerning the Nephilim, could that still be occurring? Are angels that live among us now able to take on human form and procreate with humans and produce offspring, or might that be able to do so in the millennial reign, or has God done something to make that never be possible again? Um, the answer is, is, and I think we answered this one, but um, 
The answer is, is that um, technically angels can always take on human form. And so technically they could procreate. Uh, we don't know that that's happening. Um, the answer I gave referring to the angels that are kept in chains and how at the end of the, the, the time when Christ returns, you know, Satan and his angels will be kept in chains for a thousand years. So um, I, I hope that I answered that question already. I it, apologize. I think I said that, that yeah, question already. Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for pretending okay. that I never said it. <laughs> Let's go on to the next question. Sorry about that. Okay, can you explain what Romans 11, 11, 24 means when it talks about engrafted branches? Yeah, when you're reading in Romans 11, is it's talking about the issue that um, God originally chose the nation of Israel, but this is so misunderstood by people. What did it mean that they were chosen? A lot, of, a lot of people think that when it says God chose them as His people, that they were automatically heaven-bound, and that literally it was just arbitrary on God's part. He just chose them. They're going to be with Him in heaven for eternity no matter what. That is not at all what the Bible teaches. They were chosen to be a nation that God was going to reveal Himself to, have them start to write down the written revelation, keep it, preserve it, pass it on to other generations so that ultimately the whole world could have a, a written revelation of the truth about God and the truth about life. So they were chosen to be recipients of God's truth and then to be those that preserve it and pass it to the world. When you come to Romans 11, it's saying that something has happened when the Jews rejected God in all of His fullness, when the Messiah, who turned out to be Jesus, God in His fullness was come, and they rejected Him as a nation, not every Jew. In fact, let me just clarify that. Most of the first followers of Jesus were all Jewish, thousands of them. Read the book of Acts. However, uh, the vast majority of the nation, led, misled by their religious leaders, they rejected Jesus as the Messiah, and He was God. He was the Creator, revealing Himself in His fullness. So, the baton of revelation, as it were, was passed on then to a new body of people called the church. The word church in Greek, it's ekklesia, the called out assembly. Now, anytime someone puts their trust in Christ, becomes His follower, we gather together as Christ followers, and now we are the revelatory communicating people to the rest of the world. So we have been grafted in. We're, we weren't brought in by blood. In other words, if, if you were a Jew, you were born a Jew, and part of the, uh, the wonderful benefit of that is you were given the Scriptures. You were given God's revelation just by virtue of your blood heritage. Now today, we're, we're everything. We're, we're Jews, we're Gentiles, we're Chinese, we're Asian, we're African, we're, we're American, we're all these different things. But once a person trusts in Christ, now we are the ones that God is revealing Himself through to the rest of the world. Now, the written revelation is finished. It was completed uh, with the end of the New Testament. So, the Gentiles, which is just another name in Scripture for anybody that was not a Jew, we've been grafted in, so to speak. It's kind of like it's, it's the images of a tree. You know, you graft a branch in and then the fruit grows from it. Um, but eventually, eventually, there's going to be a, a change of the baton, a tossing of the baton or a change of hand back to the nation Israel. And if you read on in Romans 11, it refers to that. Eventually, Israel will become uh, a, a revelatory people. One third of the Jews will turn to Christ, but that's not until the very end or toward the very end of the tribulation. Okay. When you are saved, you have the Spirit, right? Can you walk away from God if you have been saved, or will you not be able to do to the Spirit if you do walk away? Do you really believe, have the Spirit within you to begin with? Uh, the, the, the question is usually presented in this way. Uh, if a person has put their trust in Christ and they're saved, are you saved forever? In other words, it's usually presented like, is, is once saved, always saved the truth? Or can you lose your salvation? Now, the problem with all that kind of thinking and all that kind of theology is it thinks in hard currency terms. It thinks in judicial terms. It thinks of salvation as like a, a, a present wrapped with a bow that when you recite some phrase about Jesus, that now you receive the package 
and the Spirit guarantees that you can never be lost. This is such bad teaching that um, I, I, I try to undo it every time I get a chance. So here's the reality. God has revealed Himself to us fully now in Christ, and He waits upon us to decide if we will put our trust in Him and become His followers. If we put our trust in Him and become His followers, the Holy Spirit finds um, peace to enter into us. Uh, he is welcome because as those that trust Jesus, our hearts become natural homes for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does seal us and guarantee that we're God's possession. That is all true, but it is not mechanical. It is natural. It, it comes down to this. If I've trusted in Christ and He never changes, why would I change? I'm going to trust Him and follow Him fully. I'm going to follow Him freely, and I'm going to follow Him forever. So try not to think mechanistically, you know, will the Spirit keep me forever from, you know, uh, walking away from Jesus. Think in terms of relationship. You've got to ask yourself, do you trust Christ? He died on the cross to prove His trustworthiness for you. He offers you complete forgiveness and eternal life. If you'll trust Him and be His follower, uh, that's where you want to be thinking is that what kind of a relationship do you have? If you have that kind of trust relationship with Christ, you're saved and secure. But you're not saved and secure because of some mechanical in enablement or, or, or inability that the Holy Spirit makes it impossible for you to walk away. Don't think that way. Scripture doesn't teach that kind of nonsense. The Spirit of God resides comfortably in those who trust Jesus and follow Him. Yes, we are sealed, we are saved, we are secure. We're just as sure of heaven as if we've been there a thousand years. But it's because of an authentic relationship that no one on earth or in hell could ever sever. This isn't to say that as Christ followers, we don't have ups and downs. We may even for a time fall away from Jesus. Um, but ultimately, if we've truly trusted Him, that trust will rise back up and we will return to Him. So. Great. Our next question is, Hi Randy, my family and I have so many questions, but it will be helpful if you answer the following for us. Many thanks. In Mark 10, 17, 31, a rich man has a conversation with Jesus. During this talk, the rich man called Jesus, good teacher, to which Jesus replied, what do you call, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus lived a sinless life. So why did he imply he was not good? Uh, the reason is, is because Jesus knew that the individual asking the question didn't really believe that he was God. And, and that was his whole point. He was saying, you know, he was trying to awaken this individual. Are, are you aware, in essence he's saying, that the only one that's really good, truly good, is God alone. And so Jesus was trying to get that person to understand that he himself was God and that uh, that is the only way that he could be good. So he was not denying that he was God. He was trying to awaken the person to the fact that they were dealing with God, though they were looking at a 33-year-old man. Okay. How do we show up and show love as Jesus did for all people without enabling or excusing sin? Please answer in general, then specifically to the following two examples. First example, we are invited to a close friend or a family member's same-sex wedding. Second example, Loved one is searching for identity through various beliefs like atheism and the satanic temple. Uh, let me answer the first part, uh, the general question. The general question, how, how do you show support without uh, uh, seeming to support sin or a sinful lifestyle or something like that? Well, you know, you do it the way Jesus did. You, you treat people with respect no matter where they're at in life. You do your best to communicate to them uh, if it's at all possible that God is for them, that He loves them, that He wants them to have the best kind of life possible, but He cannot give it to them until they return to Him in trust and are willing to obey His Word. So you're trying to find avenues to do that without pushing it down their throat every time you have a conversation. So it means you, you authentically befriend them. You like them as a human being. You serve them. You pray for them. You, uh, again, can't emphasize enough, you show respect for them regardless of their lifestyle. I, I remember my years of construction work. I did construction work 17 years. Ten of those years I was a Christian. And the guys on construction sites are typically pretty vulgar. 
And so when they would say vulgar things to me, I would listen to the intent of what they were saying, not the way they said it. And I would speak to their intent and I would show authentic interest in them because I, I was authentically interested. Um, a couple of my buddies that I carpool with for years, you know, I would fish with them, um, do different things, watch boxing matches with them. So I built a relationship with them. Um, <laughs> because I really liked them, I really cared for them, and, and folks, that's the secret. People have to see that we care. They don't, know, they don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. And you can't hide that if you care. And it shows itself in authentic respect. That doesn't mean that we're going along with their lifestyle. And they know the difference. They really, really do. Now, the specific things you bring up, they are very complex. Uh, what would you do if somebody you're trying to support invites you to their same-sex wedding? Uh, Christ followers will give a different answer on this. I can only give you mine. Uh, you, you seek God and get yours because, in my opinion, it's, it's certainly conceivable that each case might be a little different. I would not be able to do that. I, I would be profusely apologetic to them, and I would let them know, I think the world of you, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I believe that marriage is an institution designed by God, and it was meant clearly for a man and a woman and I can't support you in a lifestyle that I do not believe will ever ultimately bring your highest well-being and happiness. They would still probably be offended, particularly today. That's the position I would take. Now, as for the second one, that's a little more easy. When a person is at a place of spiritual exploration, that's frankly a good place. And I don't, I don't care what they're exploring. They can be exploring Reiki, witchcraft. Uh, new Age Theology, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't care. As long as they are exploring spirituality, this gives me, as a Christ follower, an opening to talk to them and say, you know, you're looking at these other things. Have you ever, as a thinking, mature adult, considered reading the Scriptures, the New Testament? Have you ever really just given time as a thinking adult? Would you consider doing it with me? We, we'll pick a book in the Bible We'll start reading it together, the Gospel of Mark, and we'll start discussing things. This gives you an avenue. Don't attack their involvement with the Satanic Temple or don't attack their um, escapades in atheism. Uh, rather, say, you know, you're exploring all these things. Would you consider exploring what other intelligent people down through the ages have found to be very credible, the record of one that claimed to be the creator of the universe named Jesus? So, so that's the way I, I would handle those two. Okay. I really want to know about those guineas in Randy's yard. <laughs> Do you eat them? <laughs> no, I would not dare eat them. But um, some people do, and they say it's very good. Yes, yes, they're supposed to be very good. No, but what, what we are uh, going to try to do is uh, eat more and more of their eggs. They're a little bit tricky capturing their eggs. They lay them all oh, okay. They're not like chickens, man. They lay, lay them all over the place. But they're, they're pets. And, uh, they're we, great at getting bugs. Yeah, they, they are great bug eaters, particularly ticks. And we have a lot of deer ticks up here uh, in the mountains where we live. And so. they're mu musing to watch. They really are. For us, yeah. yeah. We, we, we have kind of, we're desensitized to, you know, to them. We, we don't even mind their crazy squalling. And, uh, <laughs> but it's not for everybody for sure. So thank you for asking. <laughs> okay. Our next question is, I dated a girl. Thankfully, it didn't last that compared Christianity to a cult. We, don't, we drink blood, eat his flesh, chant, perform ceremonies. i never been able to shake her comments. What would you say to convince her that Christianity is not a cult? Well, uh, by her comments, what I can tell you is this. She knows nothing about Christianity. She knows nothing about the Bible. She has heard silly things said. She's probably picking up on some version of Catholicism where they believe that the Eucharist or the wafer in the Lord's Supper is his actual physical body and that the, the wine actually turns to his blood, which is nonsense that's not supported anywhere by the Bible. This, whoever you are, <laughs> this girl has no credibility whatsoever. And uh, other than some emotional tie you may have to her, my man, you just need to move on well, and forget it. Well, he did it. say, let's add, thankfully, it didn't last. Okay, he okay. He did say that right away. <laughs> okay. But hers is one of the most ignorant 
statements. It's the kind of cliche, ignorant statement that you pick up uh, at certain YouTube sites for, for atheists that think they're being clever. And they say these things because they know that the average Christian is ignorant of the Scripture. And so you, my brother, don't, don't be that guy. Don't you be ignorant of the Scripture. You study for yourself and you'll know that what she's saying is idiotic. In the Bible, many individuals become kings at an age so young it doesn't make sense. Recently, you mentioned someone who became a king at seven. Were these folks figureheads until they became a certain age? What is the youngest age, roughly, when the kings were actually ruling? Yeah, the case that I talked about was the case of Joash, who had to be hidden away for the first six years of his life from his maniacal grandmother who wanted to kill him. Uh, now, under that time, he was under the tutelage of the priest named Jehoiada. And Jehoiada, if you read the whole th story, continued to counsel and direct and nurture the young king until he became old enough to you know, guide the affairs of the kingdom itself. By the way, th this has been done throughout human history, not just in um, the biblical kings, but kings from every tribe and tongue, whether it's an Assyrian king or it's a Babylonian king, you're, you're born with that kingly blood. And sometimes as it happens, you're just a child when the throne is given to you. However, you have a whole court of individuals that are giving you advice and counseling you and keeping your, your rule in the place that it should be until you get to the age where you can start to you know, make wise decisions. So that, that's the way it was done in the biblical king, kings as well. Okay. Your teaching on Noah this Sunday has me wondering. I just can't help but, but to wonder what Noah may have felt like in the first moments of any rainfall after the flood. Would he have wondered to himself in those moments if it would be the start of another flood? Well, um, what this tells me is that you did not read the story of the flood, which starts in Genesis 6 and it goes all the way through Genesis 9. Had you read on your own, and I cannot stress enough, I'm not trying to be mean or smart, Alec, uh, as much as I appreciate you uh, taking the teaching of God's Word from me, man, I so want you to read it for yourself and, and know it for yourself. If you would have read in Genesis chapter 9, verse 11 through 13, you would have saw that God immediately made a covenant with Noah promising him that he would never flood the world again in that way and that he would put a sign in the sky, which is the rainbow, to assure him that the earth would never flood again, uh, though it would rain. So uh, read the story. You'll, you'll love. Let me tell you something. When you, when, you, when you read the scripture for yourself, it is so much more powerful and dynamic within you than just hearing it from somebody else. Hearing it from somebody else is good. We all have to start somewhere. But man, dig in for yourself. You, you can understand it. The Spirit of God will help you understand it. So. And then when you see a rainbow, you'll never experience <laughs> the same again. It's going to have so much meaning. And it is. It's always going to be so, so yeah. much more beautiful now that you know. Yeah, you won't be looking for that leprechaun anymore. You'll be yeah, thinking really. about God. <laughs> <laughs> we have one more last question about the Nephilim. Just joking. Nephilim. Okay, Nephilim. Yes, Nephilim. And that's it. That was, I was joking, that's it. Oh, there's no more questions? No, that's oh, okay. it, I was going okay. back. Okay, okay. So, about that. I thought you were going to do it three times, Absolutely. okay. No. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I hope I answered all your questions. There, there was one more that we, we answered it last week, but just to be sure, I want to put it to rest. I made a big mistake two weeks ago, not that I don't do this occasionally, but it was concerning a TV show. Somebody asked me about a TV show, The Chosen. I confused it with another TV show, that's called Messiah. The Messiah show is about an Islamic messianic figure. I only watched about 20 minutes of it and I said, no way, no how. I have not watched The Chosen. I have been told by others that it's, it's a reasonably uh, good presentation of Christian truth. I don't know that for myself yet. I wanna, it, we should, I it, see it. Yeah, if I can ever find the yeah. thing, I, I'll, I'll watch it myself as long as it's well done. Sometimes the biblical uh, TV episodes and movies have been so poorly done that it's hard to stomach. But, but, this, but this one might be a good yeah. one. Well, FCF, hope we've answered all your questions. And uh, let me just urge you to consider something. You'll, you'll be getting um, another devotional uh, message. We're, we're changing the title notes to, to Teaching Moments. You'll be getting a teaching moment on Saturday as well as an invitation for the Sunday service. Please consider 
taking that teaching moment that you get, those teaching moments go out, they go out on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Consider inviting someone else or sharing that with someone else. Also on Wednesday, uh, there's an archival message, one of my old messages up, you might want to consider sharing that. And then on Sundays, before you get ready for the new message, again, consider sharing that. This is a great opportunity to invite others in a non-threatening way to um, let them experience what's going on in FCF Church for themselves. Okay, FCF, uh, thank you so much, and I will be back in touch with you soon. Goodbye.